There have been many versions of the X-Men. Uncanny, all new, extreme, and one of them was actually made to screw over a massive movie studio. I'm Dave Baker for Total Nerd, and today we're going to explain the history behind the Marvel TV show Mutant X, why there are so many lawsuits surrounding it, and why it's legally not an X-Men show. Wink, wink. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel, leave a comment, and let us know what Total Nerd topics we should explain next. Cast your mind back to yesteryear, the distant past of the year 2000. Marvel's come out of bankruptcy, and the X-Men are poised to be a major motion picture. And Marvel Comics was looking at this fortune, and they were like, huh, how can we get in on this? Enter two production companies, Tribune Entertainment and Fireworks Entertainment. They, along with Marvel, concoct the idea to make a live-action X-Men show. However, it quickly evolved into, let's do a not the X-Men show. Avi Arad is the man responsible for much of the superhero media that you consumed as a kid. You might not know his name, but you definitely know his work. He was the CEO of Toy Biz in the 90s and was behind the seemingly ubiquitous X-Men toys. He's also been the producer on almost every adaptation of a Marvel comic for the last 20 years. You name it, Arad is there directly involved or somehow he's in the shadows, behind the scenes, pulling the strings. After Marvel's bankruptcy in 1996, Rod and Toy Biz co-owner Ike, the human snapping turtle, Perlmutter, gained control of Marvel Comics as it was siloed underneath Toy Biz. Arad, along with working on many other movie deals, was the point man for Marvel's fly-by-night f*** you to Fox. Regardless of if he was really the person who created the idea of doing a bootleg X-Men show, Arad received a created by credit on all 66 episodes of the show that would become known as Mutant X. It's an interesting twist of fate. He doesn't have a single writing credit on any of the episodes that were produced. You'd think a creator would have written, I don't know, one of the 66 episodes? If you're not really a writer, did you really create anything? In fact, looking at his IMDb page, he's received 119 writing credits. Or I should say, not writing credits. Either for story by, based on an original idea by, or created by. <sighs> Care to guess how many actual screenwriting credits he has? Well, one. Cody the Robo Sapien. So lovely ladies, oh, what should I do? I guess it's one thing to help adapt the works of legends like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and the rest. It's another to actually create something off of your own ideas. <laughs> Yeesh. As previously mentioned, the parties involved quickly realized that they needed to make Mutant X legally distinct from the X-Men. However, they didn't really want to do that too much so because, well, the show basically just feels like poorly edited Wikipedia X-Men, colon, the TV show. The show has plot lines around mutant cures, alternate realities, astral plane battles, and societal bigotry. More themes cribbed directly from the X-Men comics. I mean, just the name alone, Mutant X. Subtle dudes. Subtle. If you've never seen it, the show revolves around Adam Kane, a brilliant scientist who feels responsible for an outbreak of a genetically altered virus that turns people into mutants who have superpowers. So he travels the globe, mentoring and taking care of said totally not the X-Men mutants. The show follows four of Kane's students, Jesse Kilmartin, Shalimar Fox, Emma Delario, and Brendan Mulray, as they form a super team, wearing ill-fitting black outfits and just generally being Canadian off-brand bargain basement Walmart X-Men. During the pre-production of the show, Adam Kane's character was originally named Zero with an X, thus the name having an X in it, Mutant X. But, you know, that was, uh, that was too obvious. Instead, the show was just named Butin X for reasons. Surprisingly, this naked cash grab actually paid off. The show quickly developed a following. The fact that the show was basically just X-Men didn't seem to really give audiences a second concern. The show mainly focused on a Monster of the Week episodic formula. Very little overlap or story continuity was ever referenced, especially after the show's main villain, aka dimly lit Andy Warhol, aka definitely not Magneto, aka Mason Eckhart, 
exited the show. He was played by revered theater actor Tom McManus, who bowed out at the end of the first season to pursue more theater work, which sounds like kayfabe before nobody got along with him, so they wrote him off the show. The rest of the bootleg superhero brigade included Jesse Kilmartin, played by Forbes March. Think gender-swapped bowling alley Kitty Pride. Next up is Shalimar Fox, played by Victoria Pratt. She's basically 2001 leather coat wearing version of Manimal. And then we have Emma Delario, played by Lauren Lee Smith, who might as well have been called Fever Dream Jean Grey, because it's just kind of one-to-one. -one. And finally, Brennan Mulray, played by Victor Westbert, is a dude who can project really bad CGI electricity out of his hands. Very exciting stuff. In fact, the rest of the cast was filled out by many stalwart American and Canadian actors. In fact, Adam Kane might look familiar to you as his actor, John Shea, played Lex Luthor in Lois and Clark. The New Adventures of Superman. If you're thinking to yourself, I should totally check this out. Tiny Rivers Cuomo is really making me think this show might not be half bad. Well, eh, you know, investigate at your own risk. I'm not saying that the show is the worst thing you could spend your time on, but it's pretty damn close. However, don't listen to me, what do I know? I chose to see Beverly Hills Chihuahua opening weekend. My taste is obviously not infallible. And here's where we get to the proverbial other shoe dropping. Fox realizes what's happening and decides to sue Marvel in a case called 20th Century Fox Film Corporation v Marvel Enterprises Tribune Entertainment and Fireworks Television. Fox tried to file an injunction to stop Mutant X from airing because, well, they claimed that it violated contractual rights under the Lanham Act a federal statute that prohibits filing off of serial numbers for shit you own and then trying to resell it to people over and over again and just saying, no, it's totally different. This isn't the same thing that I copyrighted before. It's fine, don't worry about it, it's cool. Initially, the case was denied in district courts. Then in appeals courts, it was decided that it was within Fox's rights to sue for false advertising. In the final decision in an appellate court, it was decided that Marvel and company could resume production, but that the show needed to be altered so that it would be not infringing on the X-Men's core attributes. In the court documents that have since been released, it's been revealed that in Marvel's deal with Fox, it only included the motion picture rights and that the television rights were considered frozen. Fox and Marvel repeatedly refer to this optioning paperwork as the 1993 agreement, which sounds like my second favorite Robert Redford political thriller. Marvel agreed to work towards cleaning up Mutant X going forward. However, Mutant X never really got any less X-Men-y. It just seemed like Marvel and the other production companies were like, we're the clear! We're free! Let's go! Let's party! Skip, skip! <laughs> One of the only major changes to the show was that none of the characters could have code names. None of this really hampered the show, though. In fact, the show was so beloved by fans that it got a full fourth season order. Unfortunately, it didn't matter. Fireworks television had gone under and they couldn't complete the show. The third season of the show was to be its final season. To make things even more infuriating, you guessed it, it ends on a cliffhanger! Because, you know, that's how you want your shows to end. Just always, always end on cliffhangers. Abi Rod is the only person in this whole mess that ends up okay. After Mutant X, he went on to shepherd the Spider-Man franchise, the Blade franchise, and basically every other Marvel feature film outing throughout the aughts. As if that wasn't enough of a golden parachute, Arad also helped launch the MCU and co-found Marvel Studios. That's right, Iron Man was set up at Paramount with Tom Cruise starring as the now iconic, alcoholic, would-be superhero, Iron Man. And we stuck in turnaround. So what did Avi Arad do? He got it back, so Marvel could use it as their first outing for their film studio. Most people who are embroiled in a mildly successful Canadian TV show that gets sued out of existence, they're usually driven out of town. But not our dude Avi Arad. It's his world. We're all just living in it. Look at this guy. He's rocking a leather jacket. Costs more than your parents' house. And he's got, mmm, chef kiss gif, mmm, chef kiss gif, a skullet. That's some serious f you, I'm untouchable confidence, man. In fact, he's so convincing, I am gonna follow in his footsteps. Next time you see me, eh, I might just be rocking a little bit of the old fashioned skullet. You heard it here first. After the show went off the air, there was a fan petition to bring it back. However, sorry Sonic and Star Trek fans, Mutant X isn't an example of a show that the fans could actually have input in. R.I.P. to Mutant X. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Fans wanted the Sci-Fi Channel to save Mutant X. They had recently just done something similar with Andromeda. But you know, that just didn't happen. To add insult to injury, 
Tribune, the other production company, decided to fulfill the order by running 52 episodes of reruns and retitling the show The Best of Mutant X. As a reminder, there were only 66 episodes ever produced, so saying that 52 of those episodes were the best is rich, to say the least. Oh, what? You thought we reached the end of this story? Oh no, there's still more lawsuits. Tribune sued Marvel for $100 million for fraud and breach of contract. Tribune claimed that the show was supposed to be bolstered by the X-Men license and that Marvel had lied to them about their deal with Fox. I mean, understandable. Marvel countersued saying that Tribune's faulty business practices were the real reason that Fireworks Entertainment went out of business which then resulted in no fourth season. It must have been exhausting to be anyone within a 500 mile radius of anything having to do with Mutant X. There's so many lawsuits, I'm just tired reading about it. The suits, well, they settled out of court in 2005 and all was right with the world. Too bad though, that we'll never get any more Mutant X. But also, is it really too bad? I don't know. Well, what do you think? Does that feel similar to how Marvel handled some of their other legal disputes? Do you wish that Marvel would make a Buffy Season 8 style continuation comic for Mutant X? Are you as enthralled with Avi Arad's ability to conquer the world as I am? I mean, you should be! Skullets, baby! Skullets! If you liked this video, please comment below and let us know what other area of nerd culture needs an explainer. And in the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.